Hey everyone, it's Dr. Namani and Dr. Louie here again today with the Athlete Spine, and we're really excited to have Dr. John Yoon here today with us. Um, so Dr. Yoon is the Director of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery and one of the co-directors of the Spine Fellowship, uh, the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's an assistant professor. And um, today our topic is going to be uh, about cervical disc replacements in high-impact athletes. And Dr. Yoon is an expert in this topic, having, re having recently operated on Joel Farabee of the Flyers who had a cervical injury. And so we're really excited to have you on today. Thank you. Thank you for having me and really uh, great to connect with you guys. Yeah, and, and this is sort of a fun topic for us. I mean, we're in the middle of the NHL season as well as the NFL season when we think about contact sports that are really popular. And, you know, we get the question a lot, right? You, you see news on players in both of those uh, sports who have, you know, neck injuries all the time. Um, and a lot of them are disc related and, and may require surgeries. And, and obviously yours was higher profile and then someone who got a disc replacement and was able to return back to play. But, you know, I know you see those types of athletes and, and many more, you know, how do you go about thinking through uh, these patients when they come in and, and sort of what goes through your mind? And um, there's a lot of these players out there suffering from lots of cervical injuries. Yeah. No, it's very true. And I think, you know, uh, especially in the hockey where there's a uh, exposure to sort of a high velocity, you got to think about sort of high velocity trauma to their head. And these guys go through sort of multiple of that uh, during the game. And, you know, I, I wasn't a you know huge hockey fan, but recently, you know, I became more <laughs> of a hockey fan in, uh, in Philadelphia and, you know, recently went to watch the game with my wife. And, you know, it's almost like the, you know, there's a side sort of game where you can pick the battle with the guy and then, you know, the ref will kind of <laughs> you know allow you to punch the guy. And then if it gets serious and then they'd step in and, and stop it. But really, I mean, these guys take a beating and, um, and, you know, neck is one of the first things they, they get hit, you know, and then there's a lot of whiplash injuries and there's a lot of blindside injuries where you're not seeing the guy coming. And, uh, and and I think you know during those impact is you know there's almost a, a gliding you know in football there's a friction on the ground so you know maybe you the the grunt of the force is going to be translated to your knees or your hips maybe the back but when you're on the ice uh, I mean the entire sort of you know the force is coming at you and then you know neck is the first thing to really get injured so. Yeah, uh, we saw, uh, you know, we see uh, quite a bit of athletes with this issue. And when they do happen, uh, you know, most commonly, you know, it's a central disc or uh, rarely you see something way off to the side where, you know, it could, it could be dealt with without the instrumentation, you know. So, you know, I, I, oftentimes I think about, you know, what's the long lasting thing that I can do? So that they don't have to get a reoperation, and at the same time recover these guys, so that they can go back to playing. And when I see, when I see a disc herniation that's very paracentral and it's amenable to doing a decompression from the back and do a discectomy, I'll actually would favor that. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, it's not. Oftentimes, what you see is a central disc herniation. And when when the disc herniation is very central, um, I think it's kind of hard to get it from all the way from the back. Um, it certainly is possible, but uh, uh, that can be, you know, that can present a challenge. And yeah, and I, I, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I was just gonna uh, fill in that. Uh, yeah, I think you bring up some really, really good points. That you know, these disc injuries that that athletes can have, you know, can in the cervical spine. Really, there's three different types of treatments, right, that we can do for them. You know, uh, the one that you brought up was a, a posterior cervical foraminotomy where you basically, you know, make more space for the nerve from the back. But the problem is if it's a central disc herniation, right, is that the spinal cord's in the way and you can't really get to it from the back, you know, and, and that leaves the two other options from the front, either a cervical disc replacement, uh, which, which is in many ways people think of as a newer treatment, but it's really been around for a decade, right? Just not really in these, in these high impact athletes. Uh, whereas the tried and true, you know, kind of uh, treatment in these uh, collision athletes is, is an ACDF, right? And, there have been plenty of athletes that have had those that have gone back to play ice hockey and gone back to play professional football. Um, and I think that one of the things that people often worry about is what's going to happen when someone takes a big hit, right? You know, are the, is, is the implant going to get dislodged? Is there going to be uh, a dislocation event or is there something catastrophic that's going to, that's going to happen, you know? So how do you think about 
you know, um, you know, in, in, in hockey, you know, are there particular things, there's a lot of disc replacement devices that are out there, you know, how do you, how do you think about which type of implant to use and whether the, the particular athlete's okay for that? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And I think, uh, you know, there, there are multiple iterations of devices now, you know, I think back in the day, uh, the pro disc and the uh, more Brian disc, uh, where uh, a lot of the implants are sort of bulky to place and, and it's a, it's got more of a restraint a model so that it allows a good flexion extension, but not necessarily lateral bending and rotation for more restraints. Nowadays, I think, um, you know, there's many different devices that, uh, that are first easy to place and, and second, it allows a lot more range of motion in, 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 in people and it restores a natural motion. Um, but yeah, in a high sort of impact, like a, someone that needs to go back to very high activities, uh, you know, I do worry about, you know, uh, uh, you know, these unforeseen events, you know, because, you know, a lot of these devices, if you look at the biomechanical studies, they were done in a, um, they don't expect someone to have a uh, high blast, you know, like <laughs> high velocity injury. You don't, you don't, you don't sit there and punch the cat you know, punch the you know, models and then, and then see what happens. Usually they, these get these implants replaced and you do a multiple, you know, I think the million cycle of flexion extension and see whether the implant stays, but they don't really do a biomechanical testing of a sort of high velocity thing. So, yeah, I do worry about that, but, you know, there has been, you know, um, you know, sort of a similar high, high activity and, potentially um, exposed to high energy uh, uh, afterwards is the Marines, right? The military personnel and Marines. And, and a lot of them have received the TDRs. And, you know, there are studies that looked at, you know, these, uh, you know, so Marines that had a cervical disc replacement and, and followed their, their, their career. And, 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 you know, most of them do fine. Um, and they're able to go back to sort of their, their activities and go, go back to the duties um so you know in in a similar sense that you know if someone like a you know athlete that needs a range of motion then needs to go back to the activity as early as possible and then still retain that ability to um you know um flex their neck look around um although there is a risk of you know some of these devices becoming dislodged um i don't think that i don't think we truly know whether that risk is higher necessarily with TDRs. If you imagine that the, you know, if, if you use an ACDF plate and the screws, yes, I think biomechanically maybe that's more sturdy. But is it fair to say that yes, certain certain amount of force required to dislodge them? Yeah. What's the difference between the two technique? I don't think right. anyone really has that. Yeah, and, and 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 that's the big debate, right? You know, if we've had NFL players who have undergone a cervical disc, like a fusion, an ACDF with a plate, and they've been able to go back, you know, why are there not more NFL players who have publicly undergone a disc replacement? And, you know, we come from, you know, Dr. Nwani, we come from an orthopedic background where if there is a problem or disease in a joint, the first thought is not, well, hey, let's go fuse it. No, you, 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 figure out different ways to try to maintain the motion. And there's lots of different joint replacement devices. You know, why do you think that the spine is so far behind, especially in the cervical spine where, um, like you said, it, it's still really forward thinking to even think about, you know, putting a disc replacement in a high contact athlete. You know, why is the spine world so far behind, even in the neck that doesn't bear that much weight compared to a hip or a knee or even an ankle? Yeah, I think that's a very, you know, multifaceted sort of thing. And I think it's fascinating because there are, you know, if you if you remove yourself from high velocity, just look at the general population. There has been good randomized controlled trials, level one evidence, you know, meta-analysis out to 10 years that compares the you know, this replacement versus an ACDF. And then, you know, those results are, you know, pretty convincing that the uh, TDR um, preserve it, it, it leads to less reoperations, and then leads to less adjacent segment surgeries. Um, and you know, the, the, and those people at the same time do enjoy the range of motion uh, that the ACDF sort of takes away. 
but despite the level one evidence, we continue to still fuse people a lot. Um, and I think, you know, I think there is a, a big component of it is that I think a lot of people are, a lot of surgeons were trained on ACDF and, and it, 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 it is, I, I think it is more difficult to do TDR uh, well, um, mm-hmm. because you have to spend the time, yet you do want to get the implant in the midline. Um, some of the implant have keel, um, so you have to create the keel. Uh, you do want the implant all the way posterior. So in the ACDF, you know, the graft can be, you just don't want the graft to be too posterior, but, you know, um, but the implant for the TDR, you want to maximize the footprint so, so that, you know, it has a good contact with the end plate. So, it, so, it, it, so you, you're, 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 um, it, it, most of the uh, TDR has a little core in the middle that moves around or depending on what this design is. So you want to maximize the footprint and that requires you to put the implant all the way posterior. So that can be technically challenging. I think that's one, one component. I think another component that's a big driver is the, you know, reimbursement, you know, um, you know, TDR is, uh, there is a separate code for it. But it is reimbursed less than uh, as if you do an ACDF. So um, I, I think that's for the general population. I think for the high impact, you know, velocity like a, you know, a hockey player, maybe I'm crazy for doing it. Um, and but you know, I, I really kind of think about think about like you know what what would I want if I'm yeah. you know twenty some year old uh, on a contract and. And I need to go back to, you know, play as fast as I can. I don't want to, I don't want to lose a range of motion. Yes. I mean, there is a potential, um, you know, um, drawbacks, I guess, if you get hit, you know, blindsided whiplash, but I think any, you can't really predict the catastrophic event to happen. And then, and then that's not to say that whether the ACDF would have prevented catastrophic event to happen if you get a whiplash injury. So, for me, I, I thought about it from my perspective uh, and I put my put myself in their shoes and be like, what would I want if I'm in their situation? And, you know, to me, the, the total district replacement for a single level made most made the most sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that I think that's a really good way to think about that. A lot of times, you know, we we, we what we ultimately want to provide for our patients is what we want for ourselves. And I think that. Uh, you know, the, the real question that a lot of us, uh, you know, who, who treat athletes have is, you know, who's going to be the first uh, professional uh, football player that, uh, that that gets a TDR and who, who's the surgeon that's going to be the one to do it and, and what kind of uh, position is that person going to play? And I, I have no doubt that at some point, you know, in the next next couple of years, we'll see a professional football player uh, get a disc replacement. It'll be really exciting to see that. Um, so, hey, uh, Dr. Yoon, it's really awesome to have you on today. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's been great to hear about uh, all, all these all this new technology that uh, our, our athletes uh, um, are able to benefit from and your thoughts on, on, this, uh, on this patient population. Um, and in fact, I'm about to drive my, uh, my son to hockey practice, and uh, I'm just going to be uh, hoping that he's not going to have a cervical injury that's going to need your services. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I can only imagine you watching the game with your wife last week and, and just <laughs> watching the whiplash injuries occur and just like, oh. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully the implant stays still. I mean, that, I guess that's sort of the lives that we live every time we operate on someone and we see them, you know, going back to whatever activity. But no, thank, thank you again. I, I think your insights are very valuable. And then, you know, the viewers are really going to enjoy your perspective having actually, you know, walk to walk and talk to talk and perform this surgery and in a high profile athlete. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. And, um, and yeah, really finally good to catch up with you both. Yeah, absolutely. So as always, you know, sure. don't forget to like and subscribe and, and follow us at Instagram at The Athletes Fine. Take care, everyone. Do. All right. Take care. Bye.